to the Thoughtful Software Podcast with your hosts, Andrew Wolf and Fahad Shokat. Thoughtful Software is a set of values, principles, and techniques to fuel digital innovation. We want to help usher in a new approach to the way software is imagined, designed, and built. Our guest for this episode is author, teacher, and keynote speaker Yuval Lowy. Recognized by Microsoft as a software legend, Yuval has been in the software industry for over 20 years and is definitely one of the world's top experts and industry leaders. Andrew, Fahad, and Yuval discuss insights, techniques, and breakthroughs in architecture, project design, development process, and technology. They also talk about Yuval's latest book, Writing Software. Make sure to take some notes along the way as you listen to this software architecture masterclass. You all, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you on. Um, and just to start from the beginning, uh, we found it skipless to transform the software industry. We've seen studies, uh, you know, that where 68, some 68% of software projects fail. And you wrote in your book that, you know, the software industry is in a deep crisis. So anybody who's willing to take on this, you know, massive challenge to, uh, you know, fix and transform software industry, we want to talk to. So it's great to have you on. So it's, I was just saying in the pre-interview to Jessica that I get invited a lot to podcast and webcast and such. And when I got the invitation for yours and I looked at your website and I saw that your mission is to transform the software industry, I said, kinder spirits, brothers in arms, I'm, I'm, go- I'm, I'm using those guys as <laughs> <laughs> priority one because this is exactly what I've devoted, uh, I would say, my career and uh, by extension, my company I designed to do. So I'm a software architect, but some say I'm the software architect because I spent my entire career on architects. Uh, architecture is actually easy. Uh, I can teach architecture in about four words. In fact, in the book, everything you need to know about architecture falls into four words. It's not a big deal. But what are the skills and techniques and ideas that architects needs to actually have? Well, we can spend years on that. And 20 years ago, I founded a company called iDesign, devoted for the sole purpose of doing software design. And when I'm saying software design, I mean not just architecture, I mean also project design, designing the project to build that system. And I've mentored hundreds of architects all over the world in direct engagements. And I also conduct masterclasses on these ideas. And so I have taught it to thousands of architects all over the world and uh, literally launched the careers of those architects. Before I designed in the late 90s, I was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company and I managed the the architecture department. Before that, I was the vision architect. Before that, I was a project architect or just an architect. I was always the architect. I'm actually at the very beginning of my fourth decade doing this. And so uh, where did I leave my walker? I have to look. Uh, but <laughs> And I've published uh, more than 100 articles and system-wide papers, published uh, eight books. Writing software is the last one. I speak at development conferences. I never worked for Microsoft, but I was part of the strategic design effort of uh, C-Sharp and WCF and related products. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend, something they only gave to six people so far due to the impact they've had on the industry over the years. That's incredible. Um, That's a lot of achievement. Uh, uh, On the architecture side, I 100% agree. Um, I actually sum up architecture uh, in two words, which is business enablement. Um, at the end of the day, everyone's in a business of something. If you're an open source, uh, you're getting adoption. You're uh, trying to solve a problem and you're trying to share the solving of a problem across many different people, but you're still enabling something. And Right, that's, but, but that's more like a why as opposed to a what. True, true. And even then, right, it, something so simple to describe what software architecture is, is still like it. <laughs> the practice of it, you can, you know, I've designed hundreds of systems myself, Fortune 100s, same, uh, not as to your depth, of course, I've not spent four decades architecting systems, but I've seen the vast majority of projects and uh, it, it's hard. Uh, it's hard. You know, it's the amount of trade offs, the it's impossible unless you have to sit there. And, and you know, these enterprise systems are only getting more complicated. And when we started, uh skip list when i started it 
um, we were working on a system that was literally, I think it's like 55 components um, across uh, needs for this uh, smart home initiative, a uh, Fortune 100 company. And to fit all of that and create a system that is coherent and long lasting is something that is both an art form, it's a science, but it's something very few people can do. And uh, being able to teach someone to be able to do that is a tremendous achievement. So I commend you on that. Thank you. And, and as much as I'd like the compliments, there's less to it than meets the eye. There's some simple universal principles of how you go about doing it. And if you're equipped with it, then it just flows very naturally and very sound and it's very structured and there's, there's no need for art and craft and, and cloves of garlic and, <laughs> and, and, and so all, all the witchcraft, that all just, just melts away. Um, now I do agree that it's challenging, but it's not challenging on the technical level. The challenges in doing it right are all in your head. It's only in overcoming human resistance and wrong cultures and so on. And one of the reasons that we see high turnover rate and attrition with software architects is precisely because of these compromises they had to do. Because you start with these lofty goals of how you want things to do and work correctly and such, but then you give in to expediencies and, and uh, deadlines and all the excuses. And excuses, by the way, are always just distractions. And if you do it, if you keep doing it, it, it erodes you and it creates a gap between what you thought the system, your project, your life, your career are going to look like and what it actually ended up like, look, looking like. And this gap is, is very corrosive. On the other hand, if you don't compromise on your principles and your conviction, if you insist on doing it right, then you withstand time much better and you don't burn out. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so I've summed that up, that exact principle in uh, a, a phrase I say, earn your complexity. And so many people want these great things. They want the fast cars, big houses, and the, the ancillary things in other fields. And I always say, well, first you start with a Kia, you start with a used car and you earn your complexity. You work hard towards earning that complexity, but you start very simple. And as long as you keep it simple, uh, don't fill your head with all the things you want, but all the things that you need now, and then you have a vision, you'll achieve it. But it's taking it one step at a time, knowing where you're at and knowing where you want to be. And like I said, earning that complexity. And you can apply that to architecture, you can apply it to code, you can apply it to your life. And you'll find that it's a very relieving effort of just, I don't have to do all this stuff right now. I only have to do what I need to right now to continue towards the next step. Right. Right. I, I see what you're saying, and, and, it's, and it's true in anything, like you said, you know, the tensors on our journey and so on. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure complexity is the right word, though. Um, it's, it's particular, right? Uh, uh, the phrase evolves every, every so often, but... Oh, there you go. Because, <laughs> um, again, it's, it's, earned, it's, it's recursive, and so you earn your complexity. Even that phrase has earned its complexity throughout the years. But, you know, there's, there's some... There's some tasks and some problems that are inherently complex and no amount of technology, no amount of anything can change it. And there's a whole set of mental tools of how to deal with such things. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and by the way, most people tend to compl to conflict and confuse complicated with complex. Yep. They're very, very different. Very different. Uh, a clock is complicated, but it's not complex. Yeah. Uh, a complex system is characterized by the fact that we can never truly understand it. Uh, three bodies orbiting each other is not a complicated system, but it's highly complex. There's no amount of telling of what would happen next in a three body system. Yep. And software system used to be just complicated. And I would say somewhere around 10 years ago, uh, they turned into being complex system as opposed to being just complicated. We have an entire branch of computer science and deep learning where people know the outcome you can very easily measure the outcome of a machine learning model, but you can't prove how it did it. Like the math is there. And I'm sure if you took the time to go through the billions of nodes and the uh, mathematical functions that make up a deep learning system, uh, maybe you could come and prove it, but no one is really doing that. And that makes it complex. Like you said, you can't, you have this model right. now that is your system that's made. On the other hand, people also confuse 
a complex system with an out-of-control system. You can actually have highly complex system where there's no analytical understanding, no ability to model what happens inside, but you can perfectly control it. Yep. And the classic example is, is your body. The way the body regulates its temperature is a highly complex system. We don't fully understand metabolism. There's no mathematical model for the liver and so on. And yet, when you're cold, you put on a sweater, and when you're hot, you take it off. And so you can absolutely control using very simple means, very complex systems. Uh, similar things go with, with the fighter jets flying in the sky. There is no understanding of the turbulence of the tip of the wing, and the Navier-Stokes equation is un, are probably unsolvable. We're not even sure if there is a solution. But if it's too, it's too low, you, you, you pull up on the yoke, or you gas up the engine, whatever. And so you can use very simple means to control very complex systems. You, you, you'd never, in, in engineering, give in to complexity. Nope. That's how you lose. No, exactly. That's how you lose, exactly. Now, that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that you also just accept it at face value because there's always things you can do a priori to reduce complexity so that you will have uh, the easiest battle on your hand, right? And I would argue that if, if, the, if a project has unknown level of complexity that you cannot manage, the project should never be done. That's, that's basically failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Sun Tzu said that winners win and then they go and fight. And losers go and fight. You need to actually have all the arrays and all the strategies and all the tools that you can do to make sure that you have a manageable project before anybody writes the first line of code. Yep. Well, I think this is fascinating. And I think you two can talk about architecture for hours. <laughs> but uh, what I want to get back to, <laughs> what I want to get back to is, uh, you know, talking about the book because uh, I found it really interesting uh, coming from a person who hasn't done coding in, in software like design in, I don't know, a long time. I did that early in my career. but. Um, Tell us about the book, like what is writing software and you know, why you decided to write it now. So the, the title of the book, Writing Software, is R-I-G-H-D. It's not with a W-R. It's not writing with a pen. It's writing like writing up a falling structure or a capsized boat. And what I meant with that expression is this is how we are going to save our capsizing industry, our, our doomed industry. You start by saying that 65% of software projects fail. I'll buy 65% right now. I think the number is closer to 95%. And oh. the yes. And the reason it's so bad is because the industry is so bad. When something is bad, you, in life, you have two options how to address it. Option number one, you fix it. Option two, you lower the bar, right? And so the industry is doing so poorly, they had to change the very definition of success. Success today in software is defined as, and practically defined, as anything that doesn't bankrupt the company right now. It can, it can kill the company in the future, but if it doesn't do it right now, we declare success and victory. Well, if you lower the bar low enough, then 35% of the project are defined in success. But if you define success correctly, then 95% of the project actually fail. You know, living in the building many years too late, over budget, full of defects, with a black eye, missing a leg, is not success. Okay. Now it's better than complete failure. Something is better than nothing, but that's still not success, right? And and even success versus failure is not a boolean flag. It's a, it's a spectrum, right? So my definition of success is very different from the rest of the industry, and we can get into it. But the whole objective of the book was to help people actually succeed and help. Uh, and the way to do it is, of course, to mature the software industry and, by extension, their career and themselves into a mature engineering discipline and into proper engineers. And in the abstract, that's, that's what I've been doing uh, over the last 30 years with my own career. And I have a very diverse engineering background and I'm not just uh, a software engineer, even though I am that. I'm also uh, a traditional engineer and I have training in classic system engineering. And what I realized uh, in the early 90s that to fix the software industry, all we have to do is we don't have to invent the wheel. All we have to do is take sound, simple engineering principles that every mechanical engineer or bridge designer would recognize instantly or chemical engineer designing a refinery would recognize instantly and just apply them to software. And if anything, it's even more essential to apply those principles in software because of complexity, and I'll, I'll, tie back, I'll tie back to what Andrew is about to say, and I'll have, Andrew, hold back, <laughs> and, and here's why. In the physical world, when you're building a bridge or a house, it doesn't matter, 
there's physical constraints on insanity. Meaning, if you're going to design a house with 10,000 windows, you will never be able to build it. You don't have the cash flow to buy 10,000 windows. And even if you buy the windows on a quarter acre lot, there's not enough space to store 10,000 windows. And if you poke 10,000 holes in a building, it would collapse. Or the walls are going to be too thick or whatever. There's physical constraints on insanity. In software, there's no physical constraints on the insanity. So complexity can explode. We can design a house with 10,000 windows. We can decide to first just paint the house holding each paint molecule in the air individually, a horrendous cost, by the way, and then erect the walls and back them into the paint. We, we can do these crazy, insane things because we have no physical constraint on insanity. To make it even worse, if you were to try and build a house like you build a software system, and I keep coming back to that, ex that example in my book, you're going to get fired on the spot because everybody would see you're insane. But in software, nobody sees the insanity. It's hidden. In, in the physical world, we have dust, debris, dump fee, permits, licenses, citations from the city when you're violating things. In software, we have none of that. And so if there's no waste or there's no physical waste, there's no cost of goods, it, it looks to everybody as if software is actually free. Just write the code, right? Just change that while loop. We make millions. But it doesn't mean that there's no waste. It just means that the waste is hidden. And, and the waste is in the form of lost career and prospects and energy and youth. That is what gets wasted. But you know, nobody cares about that, right? And nobody ever sees that. Nobody sees the, the ulcers and the cancers and the broken marriages and all the, all the things that come out of bad software beyond broken businesses, right? Nobody sees that. And the way to solve it is to adhere even more fervently for those simple engineering principles. And again, because we don't have the physical constraints on, on, on insanity. It kills me that as an industry, and the, the, it, God, if I ever got invited to an agile conference, I'd burn the building or they'd all throw things at me. Because <laughs> the, the thing that boggles my mind we took one look and said, God, we can't figure out how to put timelines in a project. And the answer wasn't, oh, we have to get better. We have to get more scientific. We have to apply things that other fields do. We're like, nope, we'll just put points on it and call it a day and you'll get it when you get it. I'm like, what the hell? Like, Again, you lower the bar for success. And if you, can't, if you can't succeed, you lower the bar, right? Now, I'm about to say something that's gonna be very provocative, okay? And that's gonna give the wrong impression, okay? What you said, you know, if I'm going to go to Agile Conference and such, I call, uh, I call it the voodoo metastasized religion known as Agile. You're 100%. 100%. Because it's not Agile. It's a voodoo metastasized religion. That's all it is. And, but on the other hand, I'm the most Agile person I've, I've ever met. If you were to change the definition of architecture from enabling business to enabling business agility, I would applaud you. That's all what it's about. The ability to compose quickly, to respond to market changes, that's the essence of a good architecture, okay? But in our world, people are much more interested in doing agile than being agile. Being agile is a lot of hard work. It requires investing in system design, in project design, in training of people, in having the right skills. Doing agile is easy. Do the stand-up meeting, post things on the Kanban board. You know, it, it's just mechanical, right? And so I say that what people are doing today in Agile is nothing but buying indulgences. Mm -hmm. It's the epitome of folly, right? It's killing it. The thing that's nuts about it, like our, our, our industry, you know, we have people like, you can't deliver software with Waterfall. I'm like, I'm sorry, Waterfall put someone on the moon. Agile just crashed a fucking jetliner and removed an entire product line from the company. Like, I'm sure there are failures on both sides. Okay, so, so, so first of all, it's even worse than that. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's so much worse uh, that, and again, you have to have some decade-long perspective to see what's going on. So first of all, there's nothing wrong with the waterfall. It's always a question of context. For sure. And the waterfall was actually first proposed in 1968, but it was never named the waterfall. It was named the waterfall in 1976 in a paper in the IEEE. And... The point of that paper was that we have a life cycle that works very well in small delineated units of work, like hanging a shelf in a pantry or remodeling a kitchen, but fails visibly on large complex system because nobody can actually be smart enough to see all the interactions and the unintended consequences of certain design decisions and such. And, and as a result, it doesn't work on complex systems. So the whole point 
of that article was that something that works very well on small delineated units of work, like say a service, fails miserably on a system. And it was immediately adopted as the gold standard for doing systems. So let, let me say it again. Somebody writes a paper about what not to do, and then it's being adopted as the gold standard of what to do for 30 years, okay? So it took the industry 30 years of purging that nonsense, okay? Now, the logical mistake is that there is never anything in life which is good or bad. For example, you have to drink water. If you don't drink water, you are going to die. On the other hand, if you drink four gallons, you're going to die. You have to have salt. Without salt, you're going to die. Salt was so valuable in ancient times, the legionnaires of Rome were paid with salt, which is why the word salary is actually salt in Latin. On the other hand, if you eat two large teaspoons of salt, you're also going to die. So nothing is truly good or bad, right? It took the industry 30 years to purge the nonsense of using waterfalls on big systems. But now the pendulum has swung completely to the other side. And any attempt of using any kind of planning, critical thinking up front, all of that is labeled as the evil waterfall that should not be done. Yep. And Agile was brought in the late 90s, early 80s as a cure for the evil waterfall. But because it allows people to ignore all critical thinking, I say, and of course, by doing so, it made things worse. I say Agile is a disease masquerading as its own cure. Yep. And what happened here is that if, if, if you look at, 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 developers actually don't want to do Agile. Developers just want to code. All of a sudden, we have a blessed methodology that allows them to do nothing but coding, but pretend they're doing the best practice, right? And then, and then the gates of hell are open. Could you imagine? If I, I'm a bridge builder now, I'm not a software guy, I'm a bridge builder. And I go to you and say, hey, I'm going to build this bridge. And you say, okay, great. And I say, I'm going to do it without designs. I'm going to build it as we go. And then when we're done, I want you to drive across it. You can go ahead and test it. It'll be oh, Hold on, hold on. And you want me to commit not knowing how long it will take and how much it will cost. Of course. Of course. Right? You, you want to remodel, suppose a contract that goes to Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. Johnson say, we want to remodel the kitchen. The contractor says, great. I start banging some wall, do some demo on the selling. We take how much it costs. And the contractor says, no, 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 that's not agile. I'll have to uh, build the kitchen to tell you how much it will cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it is as if the inmates have taken over the asylum. Okay, it is, it is diabolical. <laughs> it is so bad. And by the way, almost everybody that signed on the agile manifesto at the time and all the thinkers, their heart was in the right place. They've, after 20 years, they come and say, okay, that wasn't a good idea. Then. <laughs> And so, and you mentioned speaking at Agile Conference. In June, I will be speaking at Agile World and Agile Conference. People ask me, aren't you afraid of going to the, to the lines then? I say, on the contrary. Everything I say is about agility. The, the word, not the voodoo metastasize religion, not the artifacts, the essence yep. of it, right? And that's what good architecture and even yes. more, by the way, yeah. good project design lets you have. Because we can talk about project design, but in essence, you need to know roughly how long it will take and how much will it cost. Humans don't jump into the fire blindfolded. Whenever you have to make a decision of anything that's value, that requires time, capital, resources, energy, has risk, and it's true with building a bridge, remodeling a kitchen, building a house, starting to study something, it doesn't matter. You try and minimize your risk by making an educated decision. So you try and build a new house out in the country, you go to uh, an architect to design the building, you take the blueprints, you go to a construction company, and they and say how long we take how much will it cost and they say it would take two years and cost a million and nobody expect million and zero cents and uh, two years and zero seconds right all you want to see is it two million one million one year seven years what are we looking at and that's how you drive educated decisions right mm -hmm. without this rudimentary uh, information there's no hope you have failed before anybody wrote the first line of code and and, and that goes back to what i said before about the definition of success the definition yes. of success in my world is meeting your commitments. It's not necessarily doing a good job. Doing a good job is actually higher bar to meet than meeting your commitments. Meeting your commitments simply says that if you commit for doing it, doing the project in two years and $4 million, then I expect it to be done in two years and $4 million. Nor do I say that it shouldn't be done in, in one year and $3 million. You can always do a better job in that respect up to a point. But at least, at the very least, you have to meet your commitments because that enables the educated decisions. Now, you can raise the bar further and say, I want it done the cheapest, or I want it done the quickest, or I want it done the cheapest and the quickest. 
So now we're talking about something else. We're talking about what kind of a design would like to have it cheapest and quickest. But you can raise the bar even further and say, we've done the cheapest, the quickest, and the safest. Now that's kind of like the ultimate success. If you manage to pull that, you're good. And for that, you have to read uh, the chapters of writing software because the last chapter showed you how to land in that area where it's the quickest, the cheapest, and the safest. But you have to learn to walk before you can run, or like you say, earn your complexity. Walk before you can run. Let's first learn how to meet our commitments, right? The, the, yep. the most basic ABCs, right? Uh, you're going to need some agility at that conference because you're going to have to dodge a few chairs probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. So, but, but this begs the question, though, like what I'm interested in is if all we need is simple engineering principles, uh, why is industry so is in such a deep crisis? Why, why are we not teaching these principles or what's happening? Why, why is it such a big problem? Oh, so teaching is a, is a great word. Our entire pipeline is broken. What feeds the industry is larger universities. Universities teach computer science. They do not teach software engineering. There isn't a single university on earth that teaches software engineering. Now, they may dispense pieces of paper called degrees in software engineering. They are not. They are just degrees in computer science masquerading better for the industry. If you look at any knowledge-intensive area, be it physics, mechanical engineering, biology, medicine, it doesn't matter. We've made a clean separation between the science and the engineering, meaning you can study physics. You're a great physicist. You know everything about the forces and Newton and such. And I ask you, okay, can you please design an airplane wing for me? And the physicist would say no. Because if you let the physicist design an airplane wing, the physicist would say, well, <laughs> let's assume no friction, no vibration, no dust, no heat expansion, and that all wings are spheres. And then you can design a wing. To design a wing, you need a mechanical engineer or a bridge or whatever it is. Because in their world, there is friction, fatigue, expansion, dust, uh, lazy construction crews, and so on. You can study biology, and you know everything about the mitochondria and the RNA and how they interact and do a post-PhD on all of those things. Amazing. Now, I have a headache. Can you tell me if I have the flu or a brain tumor? And you can't. Oh, for that, we have doctors. You can study chemistry. You know everything about the, the electrons and the spin and such. Can you design me a refinery? Uh, no, for that, we have chemical engineers. I'm not saying chemical engineers don't know chemistry, but in their world, there's cost and time and and is reaction and what's going to be the energy cost. Maybe you should add the catalyst so that the overall energy cost is going to be low, even though the production time is going to be low, longer, and on and on and on. And so in any knowledge intensive area, we've made a separation between the science and the engineering. If you look at computer science, computer science is a branch of discrete math that was nailed to the floor by Euler and Gauss in the late 18th century, okay? A little bit before computers. If you study advanced computer science, which I did, you will get to computability theory, which is Alan Turing in the 1930s. Nobody teaches the equivalent of how to design an airplane wing or refinery in software. And so instead we have scientists. And so to begin with, scientists have a very different take on the world than engineers. When a scientist says something is good, it's because another scientist says it's good. Uh, that doesn't make it useful. If the entire pipeline is broken, then what fits in this is broken. And as proof is in the pudding, nobody insists on having computer science degrees for rank and file developers. If computer science degrees or software engineering degrees were any good, companies would insist on it. So instead, who is a developer? Whoever says he's a developer or she's a developer, you can study music, physics, whatever. One day you want to put the word developer in your CV, <laughs> shop around, maybe you'll a job somewhere. Right? I'm a, I'm a bit cynical about it, but that's, that's why it is. Yep. And so the entire pipeline is broken. And, and so that's just the beginning of, of why it's broken. And then there's software is literally in the dark ages, right? You can say, why didn't people build bridges in ancient Rome the way we did it today? And why didn't they have hygiene and washing hands and so on, right? It, it's, it's because they were missing, or, or why did we have the dark ages, which is even worse, because the dark ages were a throwback to the Bronze Age, I mean, even before, a thousand years before Rome. When, if you look at the way we do software today, it's very similar to the Dark Ages, okay? In the Dark Ages, most people had ugly, brutal, filthy, short lives. But it wasn't 100% uniform. Here and there, there were islands of knowledge and hygiene where the monks were copying the ancient scrolls of the Greek and debating Plato and so on. 
but around the monastery wall, people were covered in mud, right? And it took a thousand years to solve that, right? Why didn't the Renaissance happen in the, certain, in, in the sixth century? Why did we have to wait a thousand years, right? Because if you only have islands of knowledge, right? Yeah, it's, it's not enough. This model doesn't really scale. And that's kind of like the software industry. Here and there, we see small beacons of light, but surrounded in a sea of darkness and despair. Uh, you know, I used to say that computer science is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and software engineering is knowing it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. And they teach you about all the building blocks in computer science. So I did my master's in systems. And so, you know, you learn about all your compilers and your operating systems. You know, I can very wax poetically on CPU pipelining, but I, none of that's useful. <laughs> like I use, it's nice to know, but not useful, not for building software. Right. And there's fundamental, we can go back to the book, there's fundamental, simple engineering principles of sound design, be it system design or project design. And these principles are everywhere. Every mechanical engineer or an airplane designer or a bridge designer or a house designer would recognize them instantly. But we didn't make that, res that recognition yet in, in, in software. Yeah. Oh, and that's the thing. You mentioned a theory of computing and Turing machines and what's a Turing complete language and all of that. And that's really cool. But again, I've never like, well, is what I'm working on Turing complete? I've never asked myself that question. You don't need to. Right. It's all yeah. very useful, right? Because remember, for scientists, when something is useful, it's irrelevant. The, the only way that they know something is good is when another scientist says it's good. When, for an engineer, engineer would never do anything unless somebody wants it. There's a requirement for it. Someone's willing to, to, to spend money on it. It, it serves the general public. There has to be use for it. Okay, that makes it good. That's the definition of good for an engineer. Well, it's and then, you know, one of the things I hear commonly, like people, a lot of the computer scientists and their ivory towers yell at these kids these days with their fancy tooling. And I'm like, I, I know a lot of doctors. Uh, some of my best friends are anesthesiologists and they don't know how x-rays work. Uh, they might, but they don't really know how x-rays work. And so that, the, they're tools, right? The doctors know how to get the output of the x-ray machine, but to them it's a black box. And if, and That's right. And if, you look, and if you look at any best practice in any field, we can use analogies for medicine. Dr. Ignaz Zemmerweil discovered that washing hands is a good idea decades before germ theory and, and Louis Pasteur, okay? So it's the single most important medical procedure of all time was washing hands. It was done with, with zero understanding of germ theory. Zero. Yeah. Oh, 100%, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you can absolutely talk about simple principles, even though you don't actually understand why it works, and you can actually apply it just like you're washing hands. I can discuss volatility-based decomposition and not designing against the requirements and such, and you can apply these things not fully understanding even why it's a good idea. And of course, I wrote the book to explain why these ideas <laughs> are good, okay? But... You know, there's, when you have a child and you try and teach the child how to handle the world, which is what the parent is doing, what do you care more that the child is doing? Complying with your directives or valuing your directives? And every parent will tell you compliance comes first. Understanding comes over time with maturity and experience, but I'm not going to wait for you to become 20 or 30 years old before you realize, yeah, touching the stove when it's hot, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, don't yeah. touch the stove. <laughs> okay. well, and there's the whole thing too, is I think the industry focuses on too many concrete things. People talk about like TDD being a savior of software. It's like, that's not what's going to save you. The principles, no, 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 of the course principles not. of why TDD might work. And by the way, it doesn't every time I've seen it, it builds a shit ass system, but it, why it could work. This is a rated R yes, podcast, yes, by the is. way. <laughs> okay, um, the, uh, you know, it could work. And the principles of why it could work if you don't understand them, then the actual implementation doesn't work or even know about that. But there's a fundamental additional problem, which is if you don't have a testable system, TDD is no use. Yeah. And if you don't have a good design, if you have functional decomposition, I explain in the book why this leads to untestable systems. And so no amount of testing would actually fix you if your system is not testable. Yeah. And the, it's, crazy right that that uh, functional decomposition has been around forever right like you if you do any kind of software development that principle you might not know what's called should pop up and yet people still fail to follow it and the reason people fail to follow it is because it's hard 
the fundamentals are hard. One of my favorite things is take our field and put it in sports. I don't know if you're a sports fan, but Tim Duncan, uh, he's a basketball player. He's a Hall of Famer. He was called the big fundamental. And the reason he was called that because he did the fundamentals better than everyone. Was he more athletic than anyone? Yeah, I mean, he's a basketball player. But among bas- elite basketball players, he wasn't. He didn't have all the gifts everyone else did. But he was still one of the best, if not the best, power forward to ever play the game. And the reason was, was he passed better. He shot better. He worked on the fundamentals. And as a field, we're so worried about whether our react code work <laughs> to even look at the fundamentals and work on them and say, what is good fundamental system design? I, I love that analogy. You're not the first to have actually expressed it to me. I've heard that Magic Johnson would spend 80% of the time just doing simple hoops. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and I had a story about Pablo Casalas, uh, the famous Spanish cellist, that when he was 96, um, a journalist came to his uh, villa to interview him. And uh, the butler shows him in. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Casalas would be shortly down. He's a bit late. And... Mr. Casales shows up and apologizes for being late. And he says, I'm sorry, I was late. Uh, I was practicing. And so the jelly says, you, the genius cello is practicing at 96 years old? He says, yes, now, now, now I got the fundamentals right. <laughs> so uh, that's true mastery is actually knowing the fundamentals very well. But I want to actually discuss uh, something else that you said that we, we keep tossing this term like functional decomposition, and I want to explain to the listeners what it is. Functional decomposition is doing the architecture based on functionality, which is you're looking at the list of features or functionalities. You need to do A, you need to do B, you need to do C. And you have an A block, a B block, a C block. So you have an A block to be billing, shipping, uh, invoicing, and so on. If that's what you do, that's the kiss of death. Mm-hmm. All systems that do functional decomposition have failed before anybody writes the first line of code. And yet, this is the most pervasive way of doing design. I've never seen any system not done using functional decomposition until they've met me. And then, of course, they amend, they amend their uh, ways. And the reason why it's doing it is human nature. It's not a technical reason. And this is why it took so long for humanity to accept ideas like Copernicus and Newton because it looks natural. It looks easy. If you look outside, anybody will understand instantly that the sun orbits the earth. Of course. And if you look at night, the stars are orbiting the earth as well. It, it, it's trivial to, to deduce that. And that's what, of course, what uh, uh, Aristotle said. And, and, and it was literally heresy to say anything else. You would be burned at the stake. It took humanity 150 years after Copernicus to accept the idea. Now, today we take it for granted, but it wasn't granted at all at the time. It is a revolutionary thought that the Earth orbits around the sun. And of course, you've got to ask yourself, if the Earth were to orbit around the sun, what it looked like, and it would look exactly what it actually looks like, okay? <laughs> Just like the opposite of functional decomposition, which is volatility-based decomposition, once I explain what that means, you would say, well, of course, that's what it needs to be. It's exactly the same idea. Moving on, let's talk about Newton. Right. It took Newton to, to describe the idea of gravity. And if you think about it, that's what? You have to have an apple falling on your head? People have seen objects falling for the last 100,000 years. Nobody came up with the idea of gravity. Why? Because it's abstract, it's weird. What so the object feels these weird forces applying on it and pulling it, and the object has a calculator and it does the vector and it flies where the vector is pulling it. What the hell is that? <laughs> right? And and even Newton sounded uh, completely strange when he came up with his ideas. And Newton didn't publish his ideas for twenty years. He wrote it down. He wrote Principia Mathematica and sat on it. The world wasn't ready for it. Okay, so that's how human beings always behave, right? Functional decomposition is so easy. It's so simple. Just put the A, put the B, put the C, right? And so that's why they don't do it. And in the book, I also discuss that functional decomposition contradicts the nature of the universe because it tries to violate the first law of thermodynamics. And what I mean by that is that the first law of thermodynamics states that you can never add value without sweating. In English, you would say there is no free lunch. Now, architects in theory should add a lot of value because design is, by definition, a valuable activity. And architects like to be highly paid. I, I, I'd like to think so. On the other hand, 
they try and add value by doing something very simple and easy. If they give you a requirement spec with 1.2.3a and 2.3.5b, then you have an A block and a B block. So now you endeavor to cheat the first of thermodynamics. You endeavor to add value while at the same way, don't sweat, don't do it very easily. And that's just not how life really works. There's really no free lunch. Mm -hmm. And that is not even a technical explanation why functional decomposition is death. And yet the allure of the free lunch is irresistible. It is. And under pressure, every manager and customer, just give me the A, just give me the B, just give me the C. So, Why are you overthinking it? Why are you overengineering it? For, give me the A, give me the B. For the listeners, just so you know, this is a whole master's thesis on why Buck and microservices are garbage. Is that's what they attempt to do. We're encapsulate A, it, the perfect billing module. And then we'll build a shipping module. Well, billing has to pass data to shipping. Oh no, shipping's failing. So our billing team now has to understand shipping and shipping has to understand billing and oh no. And now you're back to where you were before, except instead of being a completely isolated system, you have a rat's nest. Most microservices projects fail because of this. That's what I meant when I said before, the system has to be testable. If you have this car web, cat's cradle, the rat's nest of everything talks to everything else, nobody can test it, right? So by definition, functional decomposed system and other projects done this way are all rife with defects and will never have quality. It, it cannot, it's ordained to be this way. It cannot be anything else. I want to get back to touch on a major point that you guys have been talking about uh, for this entire time is a major need to educate the industry. And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, like, I mean, writing software, I mean, it's a great approach and, you know, I love the book. We talk about thoughtful software when in every project we say, you know, it's almost a requirement to go through some sort of discovery or project design upfront, but there's this conflict, right, with clients that they have these aggressive deadlines. So how do you educate the industry that, you know, doing this upfront work is in the best interest of the project and it won't really impact, you know, your schedules and your costs and things like that? Several strategies and you're gonna to have to employ actually all of them, okay? First, it's about trust. If you are a professional, it doesn't matter if you hire an independent contractor like your company, or if you are just working for the man at an IT shop, you're hired to do a job, right? Now, everybody should be able, if they are professionals, to go to the boss or the customer and say, trust me or fire me. If you don't trust me, why are you paying me? If you trust me, stay out of my way, let me do my damn work. There is nothing in between. It's an illusion. It's a figment of your sick imagination that there's something between trust me or fire me. There is nothing in between. Trust me or fire me. You hire me, okay, then I'm a professional. In addition, professionals always don't actually listen to what the customer says. If somebody has a problem, we go to the doctor and say, give me morphine. Uh, no doctor would say, I give you morphine because you have, you have something wrong with that. No, what's the root cause? Are you smoking? Are you sick? So let's deal with that. I'm not giving you morphine. So just, it's the very basic of, of, of professional uh, code of conduct, of ethics, of professional ethics, of professional integrity. Okay? Uh, and, and, and it's actually, and, and then it, it goes into integrity at the fundamental level. Meaning, you mentioned uh, discovery phase, project design, and so on. You're trying to drive an educated decision to even want to actually do the project. Now, in order to answer that question, you have to know what you're building, so you have to do architecture. So at the beginning of the project, the architecture is simply a mean to an end. It's not, that's why we need to build, it's only after I have the architecture, be it of the house or of the software system, I can actually know how long it will take, how much will it cost, and commit the funds, the capital, or maybe decide not to do it. Now, suppose this is your project. Suppose you have an idea, you're a developer or an architect working at some company, and you have an idea for doing the next killer app. It's the most amazing thing. It will change the world. Well, that requires capital. And you can go and get a VC to cough the capital and take 80% of the equity and dilute you in three rounds. So after three years of working 80 hours a week on something that's most likely going to fail, you're going to end up with a sliver of a percent somewhere. Okay. Or you can self-fund it. You can get family, friends. You can sell your house, liquidate your retirement plan and get some capital. Now, if it's your head on the block, are you going to invest in doing these things? And of course you're going to invest in doing things. You're not going to do anything else because if it's a $3 million project and you only have two, you should probably keep your day job. Because what would happen once you burn the $2 million? You don't have the third million. 
And if this is uh, a two years project, but the marketing window closes in a year, we well, should probably not do anything. So when it's your head and neck on the chopping block, you will invest in these things. Uh, imagine that you're a project manager and you will be held personally liable for any scheduled slip and cost overrun. Meaning whatever you commit, you can commit for two years, three years, whatever it is, but if you slip it, you pay for it. And in that case, would the project manager or the customer invest in project design? The answer is head yes. But why is the answer different when it's not the head on the chopping block and the neck in the noose? The reason it's different is because they lack integrity. Yeah. So those with integrity will do things correctly because the need for doing the work doesn't change based on the question of who's paying for it. So that's the second answer. Where's your integrity? The third answer is insanity. Every attempt of doing it differently has failed miserably in the history of the world. According to the first law of thermodynamics, it's precluded from ever working. Okay, I can mathematically prove that it cannot work. So now, let's talk about the smartest man that ever lived. The smartest man that ever lived said that doing things more of the same but expecting better results is a definition of insanity. And so I assume that the yeah. customer or the manager wants you to do a better job than the last time. Well, given how horrible the last time was, and by definition, the very fact that you're doing it second or tenth time around is an indication that the last time sucked because if it wouldn't suck, you would never need to do it again. So it obviously sucked. The mere fact you have to do it again, but expecting better result is insanity. And you should not succumb to lunatics. And so that's another answer. It's insane. And you have to explain to them. Now, you don't have to explain what Einstein said. You can ask a simple question. How was that working for you last time? I, I'm, I'm not, I'm asking you, I'm not making an opinion. I'm asking you, how did it work for you last time? Okay. And the, the last answer I can tell you is that people that work correctly and lend their software on budget, on schedule, on quality, which means by the way, zero defects. And it's not, it's not that hard to do. Every project I was ever involved in, in my entire career, I shipped on schedule and budget with zero defects. People that do it correctly have to push away jobs, have to push away work. Why? There's an endless supply of charlatans and, quack, and quacks out there. People that know how to do it right are in short supply. You would actually increase your demand by insisting on working correctly. It is exactly the opposite. If you succumb to the whims of the lunatic manager and the hopelessly lost customer, you actually dilute your value and dilute your prospects. It's exactly the opposite. We have customers that routinely win businesses by going to the meeting with the customer and showing the architecture blueprints, the project design blueprints, the numbers and so on. Every other competitor melts away. Where's your numbers? What's your proof for it? Okay, it is, it is without, no customer of ours that has ever done that has ever lost a gig, okay? It, it, it's, you only get to lose gigs when you start doing it like the quacks and the charlatans. And so there is never any downside of working correctly. Nobody will ever come to you and say, what have you done? You met the schedule. There's just no downside whatsoever. Okay. It is a responsible thing to do. It's the professional thing to do. It's where integrity lies. I absolutely love the part. You know, I think the, the big point is integrity, right? Cause you know, you, uh, in our industry, you know, there's, you know, firms out there that will, you know, say we could do this in X amount of uh, time. And, and, you know, it's just like, you know, it's not going to work, but it's being upfront and saying, look, this is what we think, this is what we know is the best process. And we're, and the, the one thing I loved about your book, there's one part where you talk yes. about accuracy versus precision. And I found that absolutely, uh, you know, fascinating that, you know, when you actually are estimating projects up front, there's some sort of like, okay, it's an estimate, right? Like a, a, a educated guess on, you know, we think that this is going to happen in this amount of time um, and this budget. But when we actually do that discovery or that design uh, up front, and when we're getting that project rolling, then we're able to be a little bit more precise. And having those conversations, I know for a lot of people it's difficult because it's the harder thing to do. Well, let, let me actually clarify for the listeners. There's more to it to what you just said. 
individual activities, those you actually estimate, but the overall duration and cost and risk you calculate. And that is actually where the precision is. The estimation reserves are just accurate. It could be 10 days, could be 15. It's not, I mean, 15 is much more accurate than 100 on a 10 days task, right? So the individual activity level, you tend to have a lot more accuracy and precision. But once you do the proper project design with a network of activities and the critical pass analysis and putting the floats and the risk and all of that, then you get an unbelievable precision. Not only every project I ever shipped was within uh, on schedule and budget and quality throughout the project, I constantly measured how off was I from the commitments and I was always within two and a half percent. So I require actually people that I designed to be within 3%. So when they work with customers, the customer always throughout the project needs to be within 3%. And that's not optional because something else is going on. People have the wrong mental model of what it means to make the deadline. When I said I met every deadline I ever committed to, people said, well, there's a stake in the ground up there in the future. And you start doing the project and sometimes you're over and sometimes you're under. And then through heroic effort at the end, bam, you meet the deadline. That has never worked in the history of the world because all this heroic effort requires so much gyration, so much pain, the G forces are going to simply tear the project apart. The only way to meet the deadline at the end is to be on time throughout the project, which is why it's so critical to be two or three percent. Okay? So you absolutely have the precision throughout the project. And if you recall from the book, there's also Appendix B that tells you how to track the project and see where you are with respect to your plan, now to revise the plan and so on, so that you can actually meet your commitments because I define success as meeting your commitments. So you can absolutely have the precision. The, the accuracy is only the scope of individual uh, estimations. Yeah, well, I think we can <laughs> talk about this for hours, <laughs> but we're, we're hitting up to uh, we're over an hour now, um, and I'd like to wrap up. Um, you know, again, appreciate the discussion. This is absolutely fascinating. We might have to do a part two, I think, uh, and a part three, maybe. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> well, what, I, what I'd love to hear from you is like, uh, you know, just kind of your thoughts on, um, you know, you, you're, you're part of the, you know, you're making this movement, you're, you're trying your best, you know, you're gonna be, you know, speaking at conferences. You know, we're, we're also in this, in this, you know, this fight together. Um, do you see in the future things getting better or, you know, what can we do to uh, improve the software industry, you know, kind of achieve our vision? So if you look at how transformations always happen, they happen non-linearly. It doesn't matter how change happens. You don't do it by winning one heart at a time and doing it. It's a phase shift. One day, one, it's darkness, the following day, light, done. And that's kind of like how I see this is happening. And it's probably going to happen sooner rather than later. I don't think we're going to keep doing the software the way we're doing it for another century, and probably not another decade. So it's probably closer to a year than a decade. It's probably going to be the combination of introduction of uh, the ideas of writing software and new technology. So what does it mean? If you look at my approach for system design, instead of doing functional decomposition, I espouse doing volatility-based decomposition, which means you identify areas of change, those encapsulate in services, and you implement the required functionality as interaction between these areas of encapsulated change. Now, when you're doing architecture, you have a whole set of things to do, features, could be hundreds. And so there's a discussion in the book of finding the core use cases, and at the end of that discussion, maybe we can do a whole episode on the idea of composable design, you have the smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all use cases, past and future, known and unknown, it doesn't matter. And now when the requirements change, your design does not because you have still got the same set of building blocks. And now you have business agility because as the business environment change, you take the same set of building blocks and put them together in different ways and very quickly respond to the change. That is the essence of agility, okay? Now, you can have hundreds and thousands of requirements. The smallest set of building blocks required to do it is about 10 because we're talking about potential interactions and the factorial of 10 is already bazillion. And by the time you have 20, you can probably name every quark in the universe. And so a small set of building blocks, and it's about 10 dozen, doesn't have to be a big number, can support near infinite number of combination of use cases. Now, coming up with that small set is not a big deal. That can be done in a matter of a few days. The bulk of the effort 
in during development is putting those things together to compose the features. However, all the heavy thinking was already done at design time by coming up with a composable design. So let me take it to the next step. Why can't we have machines doing the compositions? Now we're not there yet because we don't have AI and machine learning that are perfect at understanding requirements. Now, humans are not perfect at understanding requirements either. I mean, not even close, okay? So all machine learning has to be is beyond power or good enough. I don't know which one will come first. And then machines can crank those compositions at light speed. No human will try and do all the permutations. Now, it doesn't have to be all the permutation because you can put interaction rules and structures and throw away all the non sequential interactions. It's obviously not a factorial of all the 10. So. And in my book, I discuss in chapter three, structure and laws of interaction and such. And you can actually put some uh, guidance here and that would reduce it to a finite number of interactions. Now, finite can still be very large, maybe a few hundreds, maybe a few thousands. So no human will do it by hand, but for a computer, it's called Wednesday afternoon. And so we are very close to the point of taking the ideas of writing software, of composable design, the design idea, having human do the design, and having a small set of developers do the implementation of the building blocks. And then we're going to have the actual composition done using machines. We are very, very close to that point. Now, the first company to do that, everybody else is going to have to do it because they're going to be out of business otherwise. Nobody can compete with somebody that writes code thousands of times faster than them. Okay, it's just they can't stay in the marketplace. The first trucking company to have a driverless truck will force all the trucking companies to have driverless trucks and so on and so forth. That's, that's just the nature of the forces involved here. And so I, I don't think it's going to take a decade and I'm actually fairly optimistic. Now I'm fairly optimistic as an architect. I'm fairly pessimistic for developers because in such a world we are going to need far fewer developers than what we need today. And so I guess it's a, it's a good way of actually ending this podcast with a career advice for people listening here. You need to take a long, hard look at the rest of your career. And if you specialize in doing those Python, Lambda expression, that's, that's probably not a good career path. It's very interesting and rewarding and creative, but at some point you're going to be replaced. But knowing how to do architecture correctly, knowing how to do the right decomposition, how to put the correct structure in place and enable uh, tools to build the rest of the system, that you will, companies will never, ever have enough of that. And so that's probably the best way of future-proofing your career. Thanks for listening. You can always connect with us at skiplist.com.